So good morning, everyone. So uh, as we know that pre-conference day is always for the postgraduates. All right. So this is going to be a session, Aishala program, well crafted, and we'll be covering all the topics. This is the basics, and that is the advanced section. All right. So this all is basics, and the other one is advanced. So if you guys have to uh, like you know switch your rooms uh, as per the talks, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. So we can start our first session, sir. So the first speaker is Dr. Arun Chakraborty. No, no, no. Oh. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Santosh and our sir, Dr. Partha Biswas and Dr. Rashman for uh, planning this wonderful session. And uh, it's got a good lineup of topics and speakers. Uh, first, we have our chairperson, Dr. R. Krishna Prasad from uh, M.M. Joshi I Hospital. Uh, he's a prolific. Uh, I mean, uh, my, my postgraduates were just saying that. Uh, uh, they attend all of his refraction classes, and he was the first uh, to take. Uh, first, uh, he was the first one to take the class session. The first session that I focus. Uh, so over to you, sir. Thank you. And refraction is bread and butter for all uh, ophthalmologists, especially during examination. Uh, if you miss a refraction question, I think the examiner is not going to be very happy. So I advise you to all. Listen carefully. Thank you, sir. Please. Thank you, Dr. Sharmila, and uh, thanks, AOC, as well as uh, Dr. Partha Bishwas and Dr. Santosh Honavar for the inclusion. As always, I'm the opening batsman, and uh, you have to face the worst pitch with the bowlers in full swing. So, uh, but having said that, uh, refraction is important for two reasons. Number one, uh, your examiners know it too well, and any uh, you know, inadequacy or a lack of basic knowledge about refraction can be held against you in the exam. And they are, they are justified for it. Because the second part is in a practice of ophthalmology. See, the work of the eye is to refract the light rays to focus it on the retina. So that is the work of the physiological work of the eye. So if you do not know that, you are going to be in trouble everywhere. Every subspeciality in, in ophthalmology has some connection to refraction. And in practice, it's very important that you prescribe glasses in the right way. And patients think that the refraction is very easy. And they think that a cataract surgery is difficult. But for us, it's the other way around. We do effortlessly cataracts, and we struggle to give a refraction, I mean, in a, a bad case. So patients think that usko ref usko glasses bhi dena nahi aata. That means they think that it's a very trivial thing, very frivolous thing, but it is not so. So having an understanding of refraction, you can have a very peaceful practice. You can really, I mean, rule over your optometries, your autorefractometers, and you don't have to be the slave of those people. So you better know refraction. You may, know, you may not actually practice it manually in future, but having the knowledge is very important. So this is a very interactive session. The idea is that a small hall, closed room, less people, lots of time okay uh, so we'll just have some interaction so we'll have a warm-up okay i know they're all been uh, uh, slightly uh, dizzy so it's you can all shout it out now i'm here why i took this mic i'm not standing behind this is because you all as any postgraduate would all start filling from the back front seats are always empty so i'll always catch up with the people okay that's why i have a handheld mic don't worry i'll catch up so if you want to give a low vision aid for near, what will you do? What will you prescribe? The easiest. Just tell, no problem. Nobody. N forget Dr. Sharmila is here. All PGs can answer. Anything wrong is fine. Yeah, basically high plus lenses. So high plus for near is good enough. But how do you prescribe them? There's a question bomb method. Like if you have a poor vision, let us say you have a macular scar. The vision is 660. The person wants to read N6. What ad you will give? Okay. So that's question bomb method. If the vision is 660. Just get a reciprocal of that. 60 by 6. It's 10. So prescribe 10 adapters. Okay. Just a starting point. It's not always 10, but it is something, an idea that it's basically on the relative magnification and a lot of physiological optics behind it. So this is a question bomb method. Okay. So you got the point. Next time when you are working with an LVA for near, just forget, I mean, remember Kessler bomb. But what's the problem prescribing a high plus? Give a high plus, let's say, for near. 
somebody wants to do some jeweler's job or some very fine magnifying work, they want to do put plus 10 both eyes, give a glasses, what will happen to him? Will he be comfortable? What is the problem? Field of vision, right? you are doing some minute work here. What field of vision? Socho, high plus. No, yaar. we want magnification. No, yaar. you are all too high five. This is a basic class here. Spherical, you go to the next advanced ophthalmology. Are no accommodation. Whenever you accommodate, so you need, if to ne see near, you need accommodation. If you're wearing a high plus, where will you accommodate? There's no accommodation. You don't have to accommodate, right? As in a microscope. So when you don't accommodate, what will not happen? Accommodation comes with the baggage of convergence. Great. So no accommodation, no convergence. So that means you are looking at a near object, trying to see with both eyes, with no convergence happening. That's a very, very difficult situation. Did you get the point? You can't just wear a high plus. You will have double vision. You have to put your all your fusional convergence. And because convergence, fusional convergence, okay, has a limitation. You will really put in a lot of eye strain. If you have a very high plus lens, you can't even do that. So no convergence, you will get into trouble. So that's why you need to incorporate prisms into any high plus to make up for the lack of convergence. Otherwise, your fusional convergence will put into a lot of strain. You will not be able to do any near work. So any high plus for LVA or anything or a professional use, you have to incorporate prisms. But how much prisms? It's always base in prisms, okay, you understand. Any divergent mechanism, like in convergent insufficiency, you need to put base in. That is the relieving prism. The relieving prism for so, for example, if you're giving a plus eight add, how much prism you'll add? Check this out. So, just add two to that. Eight plus two, ten. So, give ten prism diopters of base in prisms with both eyes. Both eyes, ten prism diopters. Okay? So, warm up hogya. I mean, now we'll go to the retinoscopy. So, this is the actual thing. This is what makes you pass or fail. They give you, you all remember Christ, okay, being hung up. You remember that cross, what Christ suffered? The same cross you will see in the exam. You will all feel like Jesus Christ at the crucifixion, okay? So you see this and I will say, boss, come on, give me the acceptance. So what is the acceptance of this? Can you tell? You are in the exam, facing, the, facing me as an examiner. What is the acceptance, madam? Anything is okay. Wrong answer is welcome. Otherwise, I'll have no value. Any wrong answer is a teaching opportunity. Tell me, what is this? Plus two, three, spear. Are, are ask a question. When they put this, ask two questions, two questions. First ask, what is the working distance? Next ask, what is the cycloplegia used? Okay, that will make all the difference. So, working distance, two-third meter. That's a dry refraction, not using any cycloplegia. Now, come on, what will you do? Minus 1.5 from which one? Both you will... No, 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 sorry, sit down. See, that's why I said, please, I told you to make this mistake so I can teach you. Okay, it's all fixed. Please subtract from one meridian only. In this A voice, if you have not learned anything else also, I'm okay. This one thing, please carry home. Please subtract from one meridian because that is common to both. Because you are putting it as a spear. You are first have to identify the spear identify the cylinder, identify the axis, right, in an acceptance. You are putting it as a spear beam, that spear works in all 360 degrees. You don't have to subtract from both. You're making a very basic, you know, mistake. Subtract from one meridian. Let us say, let us subtract from plus two. Plus two minus 1.5, plus 0.5 diopters will be your spear. Write it down, plus 0.5 diopters. Okay, then, 
try to find out the difference between that meridian to the other meridian. What is the difference? That comes as a cylinder. From plus 2 to plus 3, remember the number line in ophthalmology. Sorry, no, in mathematics, sorry, not ophthalmology. Long back you read some subject called mathematics was there. In which there was a 0 in the center, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. To go from plus 2 to plus 3, on the positive side, you have to go one day after. Correct? So from plus 2, you have to come to plus 3, plus 1, you have to move towards positive side. That becomes the cylinder. So plus 1 cylinder. And this cylinder is acting horizontally. So you need to put the axis perpendicular to it as a convention. So axis is 90 degrees. So your answer is plus 0.5 SP adapter. And please write like this. Okay. Don't add this zero. Okay. Don't say, and remember to put plus, write capital D, SPH, slash, this, this, this. In the exam. Okay. So that doesn't end here. You need to also tell the examiner what kind of astigmatism is this. So this was both plus, so it was a compound hypermetropic. And remember, with the rule, against the rule, any minus cylinder 180 degrees or plus cylinder 90 degrees is with the rule. Remember one thing. Minus cylinder 180, plus cylinder 90. You should mark it up. No, you cannot remember in any other way. So this is plus cylinder 90. So it is with the rule of stigma. Let's check it out. Now this, come on, start. I'll give you five seconds to do this. You are asking me something. You are asking the examiner only. <laughs> How will you ask? Distance at which yeah, the nice. Okay, don't say wor working distance. So say, sir, can you know the working, can I know the working distance? Okay. One meter, try refraction. Come on. So let's, do, don't write, just look at the screen. Let's do it all together. You have to subtract one, because it is one meter. Subtract, let us say, from plus two. So plus two minus one. What is the spear? <laughs> plus one. Very good. Spear agya. Now cylinder number line from plus two to reach minus three on the number line which side you should go? Negative, Negative side. How many units? Five units. Great. So you all know mathematics. So this is minus five will be the cylinder. At what axis? 90. So minus cylinder 90, what will be the astigmatism? With or against? Yeah, great. So this is plus one sphere, minus five cylinder, 90 degrees, against the rule. It's a mixed astigmatism because there's one positive, one negative. Okay? So this, quickly, homotropin, how much you subtract? 0.5. Okay? And the two thirds, 1.5. So total, two. So subtract from where? Minus two, minus two. How much? Minus four. From minus two to minus three? minus 1 towards the negative side. So it becomes minus 4, minus 1, 90 degrees. What is the astigmatism? Compound, myopic, against the rule because it's a negative cylinder, 90 degrees. Perfect. So there's a question. So what is this acceptance? Quickly, come on. I don't want your work. Just tell me A, B, C, D. Rolika. Tell me when I have 25 minutes more. <laughs> Rashmin, you can tell me 10 minutes. No, no, A, B, C, D, answer. A, no, C, just think. Your cycloatropin is 1. This is 2 thirds. So you have to subtract 2.5. 2.5 from here, you subtract, it becomes minus 0 0.25. So it's here, other C or D. You forgot your need, how to write answer, need CET. So from plus 2.5 to minus 1.75, you have to go at least towards the negative side, minus 4. So this is the answer. Okay? So this is the answer. So cyclo, remember this. Phytropin, 1. And why do you subtract? It is for your latent hypermetropia. The hypermetropia which is corrected by the normal tone of accommodation. It is not always 0.5, not always 1. That is the advanced refraction. If you answer all these, they will ask you, no, 
in a very young child with very strong robust accommodation your latent hepatitis can be even 1.5 for atopic because it's very robust normally it is this okay it is for latent hepatitis but now so this is an oblique thing now so what you do is you subtract 1.5 from here it becomes plus 0.5 from here to here you have to it's minus 5.25 and you have to put at 135 means the axis has to come at 45 degrees. So it becomes this. So what kind of astigmatism is this? With the rule, against the rule? Oblique. So 90, 180 plus or minus 15 degrees is only with the rule, against the rule. Beyond that it is oblique astigmatism. So how do you transpose this? So this is the thing. How do you transpose this? How do you transpose? First, algebraic sum of sphere and cylinder. Plus, minus, just add like that. Okay? That becomes the sphere, the new sphere. The cylinder value is kept as it is. But change the cylinder. Sign of the cylinder. And put the cylinder axis, I mean, axis as perpendicular to the original thing. So let's get, get started with this. Now, come on, do this. So, plus 1, minus 5.25. The answer is minus 4.25 sphere plus 5.25 cylinder at 135 degrees. Okay? Simple. So why to transpose? I think if I start asking, I'll not get any. Okay, well, I'll answer this maybe during the tea time. Okay, that is for the, so question time. A, B, C, D, which is the mixed astigmatism? Come on, quickly. Yeah, because to for a mixed astigmatism, the cylinder has to be higher than the sphere. Perf perfect. Okay. I think uh, this question would be difficult. Which is the curvature myopia of all four? Lenticonus. Good. Okay. So we'll quickly come to the next five minutes subjective refraction. Just remember what I say. It's very important. Objectively, you got the retinoscopy. Okay. Now you need to see whether. This is accepted by the patient. You only prescribe the acceptance. You never prescribe objectively except in rare situations. Because your working distance can vary, the patient's I mean, tone can vary, the accommodative tone, what he accepts. So you need to finally prescribe what is the subjective correction. So astigmatic dial, very simple to detect cylinders. So it's, this is, you have seen this. Okay, with this, how can we detect cylinders? Okay, how do you do astigmatic dial? First, this is for to look for any undetected cylinder or to refine cylinder. For example, you are given, let's say, patient refractoscopy shows that he requires plus two. You put plus two, patient reads six six. But still, patient says, thoda blurred hai. Itna clear nahi hai. Aapko to nahi lag hai cylinder. You are not getting any cylinder. I say, you want to say, is there a cylinder which is lurking inside? So let's do it. So that is to undetected cylinder. So what you do is at least every subjective refraction, you just can't do without fogging. You need to put a plus one onto your correction, reduce the vision to 618. This is also to prevent the patient from accommodating. Okay, that's a big thing. I can probably take some more time to discuss what is fogging. All subjective, is it Jackson's cross cylinder? Is it a binocular balance? Is it a, you know, uh, astigmatic dial? You need to fog the patient. So put plus one so that the vision reduces. Then ask the patient to look at the astigmatic dial. They are just the radiating lines, okay, of a half circle. And ask him to say which of the lines are clearer. Obviously, 618 vision, all lines will be blurred. But he sees one of the lines in one axis, maybe 90, 180, 45, as clearer than the rest. Ask him to note that. Okay, now put a negative cylinder, okay, along that axis so that all the lines, then all the lines will become equally blurred or equally clear. Now take out the fog and just check whether it is true without a fog. Okay? Let's do this. Let's say this is the thing. So let's say you are 6-6 six, six parts. I put a plus 1. When I put a plus 1 and ask him to look, it will look like this. That means there is a cylinder where there's we missed a cylinder at 180 degrees. So there's a negative cylinder. So you just put 0.25 or 0.5 cylinder at 180. All will be equally blurred or equally clear. That you need to check. It may not work. He may not accept it. But at least you got an idea that there could be a cylinder at 180. Simple. 
So binocular balance, I will not go, this. nobody asks you, but it's very important. Binocular balance is important because when you check each eye separately for acceptance, you're not controlling accommodation. Let's say I got minus two both eyes. You're checking my right eye, minus two. During that time, I accommodate. Accommodate one adapter. Then I'll accept minus three, correct? With minus three, I'm six, six, even though I'm minus two. The left eye, I'm not, I don't accommodate. I'll accept minus two. You will prescribe minus three right eye, minus two left eye, which if I accommodate, I will see clearly with right eye. If I don't accommodate clearly with left eye, never with both eyes. You never balanced it. So this is where binocular balance is one situation where you do the acceptance of both eyes simultaneously. Can it happen? Yes. You dissociate the eyes with a vertical prism. What you do is, both eyes, you have reached the final six, six parts. And what you do is, you would plus one both eyes. Both are blurred. 618, 618. Because any small change or refinement in the vision can be only made out if the vision is blurred. The vision is six, six parts. It's very difficult to discern that small improvement subjectively. So then what you do is you put a vertical prism. There'll be two synchronous charts. Right is up, left is down. So patient can see both the charts simultaneously and compare. If he is accommodating asymmetrically, one will be blurred, other will be clearer. You got the point? Simple. Just after, especially with myopes, it happens. It's very easy. Put plus one, plus one, both eyes. Put a vertical prism. Say, both are equally blurred or clear. You'll see two. You can all check it on yourself. All the subjective corrections, you can do it on yourself, whether you have refractive error or not. If both are equally clear, then that means there is no unequal or asymmetrical accommodation. Got it? Yeah, that's all. So duochrome test. Okay, we'll finish with this. Duochrome test is just for a small difference in the sphere. For example, the patient is having some, you don't know whether you are over, over plus dim or over minus dim. So it's for only a small change and you can't use in poor vision patients. Okay, it has to be at least six, nine. And it has, can be used both binocularly and monocularly. It can be used in color blind also because not the color that you are detecting. It is the detecting the hue. Okay, whether it is red or some other shade of red, it's okay. And RAM gap. So finally, this is what it is. If you see right, sorry, if you see red brighter, add minus. That means he is actually over plus. Okay. If you see green better, add plus. So remember this. This should be enough. See now pixelate. Okay. So finally, cross cylinder. Uh, Rolika, I have fun time is over. You have time, sir. The okay, next speaker is not there. Okay, sure. Uh, So cross cylinder, this is what will be asked in the exam. And in fact, I all request you to please do it yourself. It's a simple thing and it's so elegant. It's so elegant that once you've done it, okay, you will be fearless about Jackson cross cylinder. So it's about refining cylinder, I mean, axis as well as power. So again, it's like you have reached six, six parts. You want to refine the cylinder. There's already a sphere and a cylinder with the patient. Let's say. Uh, plus minus one cylinder sphere, minus one cylinder at 90 degrees, already there. Patient is six, six parts. You want to refine the axis. Is it 90? Is it 85? Is it actually 95? You want to refine it. Simple, just put a fog. Vision drops to 618. So any difference he will make out. Then what you put is you take a cross cylinder. The cross cylinder has one mm, green sign, one red sign. The green one is plus, the red one is minus. It comes in 0.25 as well as 0.5. So if you want to refine it very fine refinement, you can go for 0.25. So what you do is you just straddle the test cylinder. That means your actual cylinder is called test cylinder. What you are testing is at 90 degrees, let us say. You put a cross cylinder, straddle it so that one of the axis of the cross cylinder is at 30, 135, one at 45. Okay, let's say the negative cylinder is here first situation and positive is here. Ask him to look at the vision chart. Then flip it by 180 degrees. When you turn it around, this was negative, this becomes positive and this becomes negative. Between the two situations, ask him which was clearer. He says the first one was clearer, where the negative was on this side was clearer. And look at the sign of the test cylinder. Is it negative? Yes. Then you have to turn that cylinder towards the negative cross cylinder side by around three to four or 
five degrees only. So just put it, see clear, flip it, see clear, just turn it. So it takes 30 seconds. So simple. Okay, you got the point. If the test cylinder, what he's wearing is plus. If he was seen clearly in the first situation, the plus was on this side, so you should have turned it this side. And it's only a small, not that 90 will become 75. It's a small cylinder. And then you turn it by 95, let us say. Now you straddle that now. This way, this way. Both ways he says it's clearer. If he's the test cylinder is exactly sitting at the right axis, when you straddle it and flip it, he will not find any difference. Okay, so cross cylinder, once you start doing it, it within seconds you can refine it. So straddle the test cylinder, flip the cross cylinder, note the position of the clearer vision, move the test cylinder along the cross cylinder of the same sign. The problem is the language is a problem. How to tell you to the examiner? So many a times, so you need to probably mug this up and tell, but if you ask you to explain, you can explain. So you have to really understand how to articulate this to the examiner. So I'll give you finally the tips for subjective refraction. See, this is the gospel. Remember this for a lifetime. What is the end point of refraction? The highest plus or the lowest minus, which gives you maximum visual acuity. Because if you don't give highest plus, you are encouraging in both the situation, you are allowing the accommodation to relax, which is a normal thing. If you mess up with this, the patient has to compensate by either relaxing or by accommodating. Got it? So that is, and that should give the best visual acuity. So verify cross cylinder by, uh, cylinder by either cross cylinder or astigmatic dial. Verify spear by duochrome test and balance both eyes of accommodation with the binocular balance. So this is the final thing that you should know, okay? So never change a well-adjusted glasses needlessly, okay? Because we are so used to that spatial orientation of old glasses, you may not get used to the new. And never prescribe a large cylinder for the first timer. There's something called meridional amblopia. Let us say you pick up a patient who's got a minus four cylinder, okay? astigmatism, I mean, AR comes as minus four, your retinoscopy comes as minus four, you give minus four. He will never get used to that. It's too much. Because you have just checked, you keep on reducing. With minus two also, he's 612. Minus four also, he's 612. So give the least cylinder that is compatible with BCV, best corrected visual acuity, for the first timer. But this may not hold good for uh, pseudophakics. They tolerate better cylinders, higher cylinders. And for children, they also tolerate, not others, okay? And never prescribe a high, now we are all stopped reading. Yeah. Okay, okay. See, the thing is, for a, a mentally challenged or a special children, it's always better to slightly lower your correction, especially high corrections, okay? Like we never give complete high, high myopic correction to help them for near, because their accommodation lethargy is there. There is an accommodation lag at all, especially Downs. It's a very well-known fact that a lot of mentally retarded children, as well as Downs chromosomal abnormalities have accommodative lag. So if you, uh, now, like they have to, if you give minus, let's say child has run, high myopias were quite a common association of these children, like Downs and all that. So if you say minus 10, you give minus 10. The child cannot accommodate because if you are giving full correction, okay, that's exactly what I was trying to, I'll come to that point again. I think I have that point next. Okay, so never, you are reading from screens. You're reading from well-lit objects, high contrast screens. You, are, you can also have an option to increase the font size. So don't give plus three. We have stopped reading the books, small print, like all of you, okay. So don't give a maybe a plus 2.5, maybe the order of the day. So now we don't, for pseudo fake we don't prescribe plus three nowadays, nowadays, except for the. So reassess the need for bifocals in high myopes, like a lot of myopes, moderate myopes, pre prespiopic age group. They are better off with slight lesser, I mean, if you probably this minus four, okay. He's wearing minus four, he comes at 39 years, okay. He's almost having little problem with near vision. So you check that he's actually gone to minus 4.5. Don't prescribe that. You're putting his accommodation at stake. Already it's dwindling. 
If you increase the minus number, your accommodation is going to really be taxed. In fact, I would correct it to 3.75 to make him better for near. Slight reduction in the distant vision can give him a very clear vision with a monofocal only, without the problems of wearing his progressive glasses. So try to play around with that in the pre pis biopic age group. And finally, see this is the correction what Dr. Kavita was alluding to. Like you go to a school, there's a child who got minus 10. They never worn glasses. Let's say 10, 10, I mean 10 year old boy. Aap kya karte? Minus 10 laga dete bas. Now you think that you have done a great job. Now have you really checked his distant vision is 618 with minus 10, let us say. Did you check his near vision with that? We didn't. 10 year old boy who will check near vision? Please make it a point, check near vision in all myopic corrections irrespective of the age group. You will be wonderstruck. You will be for a surprise. This boy with minus 10, because he was minus 10, he never used his accommodation. It was always rusted. Okay. With minus 10, he's 618, but he's not even, N, I mean, he's not even N32. Why will he wear glasses? He can't see anything. He can't see mobile, he can't see books, he can't see anything for near. He will never wear those glasses. Let's say we reduce it to minus 8. His vision drops to, let us say, 636 parts or 660. But his near vision improves to N12 or N10. You drop it to, let's say, minus 7. His distant vision comes down to, let's say, 4 by 60. But he's N8. Prescribe minus 7. Because that he is comfortable for near. At the same time, having a better distant vision, he starts accommodating slowly. Over three to six months, you can hike up the minus seven to minus eight, minus nine, minus ten. By then, he will be 618 and six. Because you are allowing the accommodation to restart. So don't just check distant vision for children, especially in high myopia, because the near vision is more important than distant. He was okay with one to one by sixty with minus ten. Four by six is great it's improvement. It's the time of okay. Okay, last question. This is the last question. Near point of convergence is 8 centimeters at 8 centimeters. What will be the near at 14 years? Why such a, why are you observing silence? Because I'm, I mean, stopping my lecture. Oh my goodness. I think they need a strong cup of coffee. See, you youngsters like this nota, no, in the election. <laughs> Put nota, no, you'll be right. See, near point of accommodation is the point closest to the eye that can be seen clearly with maximum accommodation that keeps on, okay, the near point of accommodation keeps on receding with age. Okay. Whereas near point of convergence is a binocular phenomenon that is the point closest to the eye that can be seen as single with maximum convergence. It's a binocular phenomenon. There's no uniocular convergence, I mean NPC. So NPC is fixed for an individual. It cannot change. If you have good, fine. If you have less, you'll have problems of convergence sufficiency and other exophorias, okay? It is fixed for an individual. It won't change with age. If it is eight centimeters at eight years, at 14 also, it will be eight centimeters, okay? So I think, uh, thank you very much. So if you have any doubts about refraction, you can meet me later. Thank you very much for the very interactive session, sir. You explained everything in a very simple manner. Are there any questions for him? Or you, you can ask him Dr. Resh till, until Dr. Rashmi Deshmukh is getting her laptop ready. Uh, so yeah. Sir, I must say one thing. All the questions that you had covered in your refraction, when I heard the lecture once, uh, you had uh, put it up on iFocus also, you had given your lecture. Everything came in my exams and it helped, 100% sure. So, and then what? Uh -huh. <laughs> and then I what? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Dr. Rashmi Deshmukh is a cornea consultant in LUPI Hyderabad. She has many publications to her uh, credit and uh, she's worked with Dr. Dua. Uh, she's done a clinical research fellowship with Dr. Dua in the University of Nottingham. Um, due to unavoidable circumstances, I think Dr. Soham Basak was not able to make uh, to the session, so she'll be covering uh, his topic as well. So she'll first uh, start off with corneal topography. Yes, yeah, so I'll first start with corneal topography and then I'll cover some of the dry Yeah, a little bit of. Yeah. 
uh, whenever the time is exceeding, yeah. we will stop minimum. She has half now. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. She has half because she has got more speakers in coverage. Okay. Yeah, so today first I'll be talking about corneal topography essentials uh, in the next 15 to 20 minutes. First thing to understand is what is the difference between topography and tomography. So topography is a two-dimensional representation of the corneal surface. But tomography takes into account a three-dimensional image. So it is also going to take into account the posterior surface of the cornea and the thickness of the cornea and the relation between the anterior and the posterior curvature. So that is what is tomography. So what are the different techniques that are available for topography? First is the placido-based system, such as the photokeratoscope or video keratoscope, which were in vogue earlier. It is mainly based on uh, reflection of a placido disc system on the tear film, and then the reflection of the placido image is what is measured. Second is slit scanning system, which is mainly used by OPSCAN. So in slit scanning system, it is uh, based on uh, analyzing the parallelopiped image like we do in a slit lamp. That is why it is called a slit scan. So there are several slits which are sent from uh, medial to lateral and back and forth. And then the anterior and the posterior curvature of the cornea is measured. And last is the shine flux system, which is used by Pentacam, Galilei, and Sirius. So what is a placido-based topography? Placido image and placido rings are projected on the anterior surface of the cornea, and the reflected image is captured from the tear film. And topographic data is calculated from the distance between the rings, and then it is represented in the form of a color-coded image. So there are certain disadvantages of a placido system. First of all, because it is just a reflection-based topography, the posterior surface of the cornea is not taken into account. So it's only the anterior surface which is taken into account. Secondly, the central and the paracentral cornea is not fully covered like we are seeing in this particular image. So we get a very good data from the central cornea which reflects very well. But if there are any shadows like of the lid margin or the eyelashes, then the peripheral data is not taken. And then small degrees of abnormalities are not identifiable in a placido ring because the distance between the rings is what is going to calculate your keratometry values. The curvature is derived. It is not a directly measured uh, keratometry value. It is always derived using an algorithm. And lastly, we need a healthy ocular surface for a good image to be captured. So if there is a patient whose ocular surface is not healthy, then it is very difficult to get a good topography image. Next is slit scanning elevation topography, which is used in orb scan. So like I mentioned, it is it combines a projection of the slit of the light. So it is the same principle as a slit lamp and with a reflection of a placido disc as well. So it combines your slit scan and your placido disc. A combination of the two gives you the anterior and posterior surfaces of the cornea. And that is why it comes under tom tomography. Now, op scans are, there are different types. First was the op scan one, which was the first attempt at the study of posterior surface. Then came op scan two, which also incorporated the placido disc in the slit scanning system. And now there is an op scan 2Z, which also has a aberrometer included in the topography. Then Scheinflug principle. So Scheinflug principle basically is that, uh, what it says is if the plane of the object is not parallel to the plane of the film, then the depth of focus is better. That is the entire principle on which the Scheinflug image works. And Scheinflug imaging is essentially a tomographic imaging. So it will take your uh, corneal thickness, anterior surface, and posterior surface, and the relation between the two surfaces together. And how are these topography maps represented using the color-coded system called as Louisiana State University color-coded system, that is the standardized one, in which usually the cool colors correspond to flatter curvatures and the warmer colors will be towards the steep steeper curvatures. So this is an example. If we look at uh, the steep zones, they are represented in reds and pinks. And as you go towards the flatter side, it goes towards the greens and blues. So you have cooler colors. But this is mainly the uh, keratometry map that we are talking about at the moment. Now again, in the color schemes, there are two color schemes. One is the absolute scale, and the other one is the normalized scale. 
So in absolute scale, it is a fixed color, uh, color coding system for that particular instrument. Okay, so it's always the same colors which will rem uh, represent the same keratometric values and the same dioptric steps. And these steps are usually in large increments. So the disadvantage is that because there are large increments, if there's a subtle change, say from 38 diopters to 39 diopters, it is very easily missed unless it has crossed that particular step and gone into the other color, color range. And this uh, is overcome by a normalized scale, this disadvantage. So in normalized scale, there is a different scale for each map. So what the system is usually doing is, it is just taking a look at all the keratometry values and then it will by itself divide it from minimum to maximum values and then the range of colors is distributed. So the steps of increments are smaller. So subtle changes are usually picked up quickly. So if you look at this image that I've shown, it's the quality is not too great. But if you look at these two images, it is the same map, but the color coding scale is different. So you can we can just make out how much difference is there in terms of the number of colors that are used and the keratometry va values that are highlighted. Then what are keratometry maps? So there are four different kinds of maps which are usually uh, uh, depicted in a quad map, in a regular map, topography map. First is your keratometry map, which I'll explain now. Then you have two elevation maps. One is the anterior elevation map. One is your posterior elevation map. And then you have the thickness map. Okay. So what are the keratometry maps? They measure the curvature of the circle that touch that particular point of interest. So when you get the curvature of that particular point, that is your keratometry map. And there are usually two types. One is your axial keratometry and one is your tangential keratometry. So there are two kinds of keratometry maps. In axial keratometry map, this is the one which we more commonly use. It is also referred to as a sagittal map. It is usually on your top left in your quad map. It is measured from the optical axis. So there is one optical axis and the points of curvature are measured from that particular, uh, taking that optical axis as your reference. It usually provides an average of the curvature values. So if you see in this example also, it has taken up the average of all the values and very nicely missed this small little steep area or small little bump that the cornea has because it is just going to ignore that. It will take a average of most of the values. So it gives you a good estimate of the overall shape, but it will always ignore the minor curvature changes in a cornea. This is again overcome in a tangential keratometry map because it is independent of reference axis. And the tangents are at the point of interest. So it will uh, take this steep area also into account and will measure it separately and give you an accurate keratometry value in irregular areas as well. So it more closely represents the actual curvature of the cornea and it is very sensitive to focal abnormalities as well. Most commonly used in diagnosis of ectasias and assessment of refractive surgery candidates where you want to look at all the points um, and surgical induced changes and also in contact lens fittings. Now based on keratometry maps, there are different kinds of topography patterns. So uh, one is a regular cornea, then steep cornea, then you have something like a superior steepening, then you have inferior steepening, and irregular cornea such as in cases of corneal scars, and then symmetric bow tie appearance. This is a symmetric bow tie, but the radial axis is skewed, so it's not exactly um, 180 degrees. Then this is an asymmetric bow tie with an inferior steepening. Then this is a, a asymmetric bow tie with a superior steepening, and asymmetric bow tie with a skewed radial axis, which is very commonly seen in uh, cases of keratoconus. Now what is with the rule astigmatism and against the rule astigmatism? So when vertical meridian is more curved than the horizontal, we call it as with the rule astigmatism. So this is how the topography picture will appear where you have uh, usually a symmetric bow tie hopefully in the vertical meridian, then you say that it is a with the rule astigmatism. And when you have a steep uh, axis in the horizontal meridian, then it is a against the rule astigmatism. Then coming to the concept of best fit sphere. So best fit sphere is to be understood before understanding elevation maps. So after keratometry maps are the anterior and posterior elevation maps on your right side. So right side top is usually anterior elevation, right side bottom is your posterior elevation. So that usually is based on a concept of reference sphere or a reference surface. So what is a reference surface? If you look at this particular image, then you'll see all those mountains there, there is a, Oh, I'm just, sorry, I'm realizing my cursor is not coming back. Okay, sorry. 
So, um, for example, the first mountain is like a high elevation and the last one we are saying low elevation. But the elevation is in relation to what? In relation to the sea level. So the sea level is a reference surface there and based on the, ref uh, on the sea level, one is a low elevation, other one is a higher elevation. So same thing is in topography. So for example, if you look at that yellow line, that yellow line is your tissue of interest. So your system is going to calculate a reference surface, which is called as the best fit sphere, which is the green line that you see. And based on that reference sphere, whether your points on the cornea are above or below that reference surface is what is calculated. If it is above, then it will come as elevation. If it is below, then it will come as a depressed area. So that is what is important. So again, there is a color coding representation for that. If it is anterior to the reference surface, then it is represented in warmer colors. If it is posterior to the reference surface, then it goes towards the bluer or the cooler colors. Green is usually at the level of the reference surface. Now, how a normal cornea will look like in an anterior flow? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, how a normal cornea will look like in an anterior flow? So normal cornea shape is prolate, which means it will be very steep in the center and it will flatten as it goes towards the periphery. So there will be a central hill. The blue area is representing the reference surface. So if there is a central steepening, then the central uh, steep area will appear as an elevated area. So you will have the plus points here. So it's an elevated area from here. Then when you go towards the periphery, it will dip down under the reference surface. So you have like a annular C, which shows as an area of depression under the reference surface. So you see that. And then you have annular C. And then you have peripheral highland there. Th these are the peripheral highlands. Because again, it is going to go above the reference sphere. So you have a central hill, then you have an area of depression under the reference surface, and then again you have peripheral uh, elevated areas. So that is a normal cornea of how it appears in an elevation map. And a regular astigmatic cornea is toric. So vertical meridian normally would be steeper uh, than the horizontal, for example. So you have the steeper meridian which will go under the surface, and the flatter meridian will go above the reference surface. And there would be a central saddle where they coincide with the reference surface. So now just looking at how to interpret a map. So in a pentacam map or a topography map, this is a Scheinflug imaging. So you again have all the four maps that I spoke about. On the left hand side, there is a column which gives you absolute values of all the keratometry and pachymetry data and other things. First thing you look at is quality specification. So if it says OK, that means this map is well centered and all the data points were adequately captured. Then you look at the absolute keratometry values, whether they fall within the normal range. K1 is usually flat, K2 is the steep, Km is K mean. And then it gives you the astigmatism. Those are the basic things that you would look at. Then you look at whether the pachymetry values are fine. There is also a K max, which gives you the maximum keratometry value of that particular cornea which again is important in terms of ectasias. And then there are four maps. So first is your axial curvature or sagittal curvature. Then you have anterior elevation map, posterior elevation map, and the pachymetric map. So these kind of four maps are given to you to analyze how the relation between anterior and posterior surface of the cornea is. Now, what are your red flag signs which tell you that this particular cornea is not normal? So first is if you have extremes of keratometry values. Second is how is the pattern of steepening? If the keratometry values are, uh, are exceeding the normal limits, how is the pattern? If it is asymmetric steepening, uh, then it represents an abnormal pattern. Then again, thickness values. So if there is a difference between the thinnest location and the pachymetry at apex of more than 10 microns, then it is usually suspicious. And in thickness map, you should also look at the displacement of the thinnest location. So normally in a normal cornea, the thinnest location would be in and around the apex. But if it is an ectatic cornea, the thinnest location would be shifting elsewhere. So if there is, say, an inferotemporal displacement of the thinnest location, you know that this is an ectasia and a focal weakening is happening there. So the point, point of thinnest location, abnormal posterior or anterior elevation, and steepest keratometry, if they are coinciding, then it is highly suggestive of a keratoconic cornea. 
these are your normal cutoffs which i have put so if it is less than 12 in the anterior elevation and less than 16 then it is usually considered normal 12 to 15 and 17 to 22 respectively are for keratoconus suspects and if it is more than 15 and more than 22 then you have a definite case of keratoconus on your elevation maps this is so again looking at an example of red flag signs this is uh, uh, um, this is a topography map. We can see that the quality specification is okay. Keratometry values are extremely high, which is going into 50s. There is an inferior irregular steepening that we are seeing. So it's not a symmetric bow tie that we are seeing. There is an anterior elevation of more than 12, definitely. It's going into the 20s and 30s. Posterior elevation has gone up to 68, so it is definitely more than 70. And then it is also coinciding with the thinnest pachymetry point. So the thinnest location is coinciding with the steep area and the elevation points as well. So this is the thinnest point, this is your steep area and it is coinciding with the elevation point. So this is a definitely focal weakening and focal ictasia happening. So more suggestive of keratoconus. So now looking at some examples, again, this is a quad map. We can see that the, anti, uh, the keratometry map shows fairly a uh, regular uh, distribution of keratometry values, it is around 45s. Then there is no abnormal anterior elevation. We don't see any abnormal posterior elevation anywhere here. And the thickness map does not show any abnormally, abnormally thin point. So this is a normal map, okay? There's no problem with this map. Now this is a second example. Here we have a steep cornea, the symmetric bow tie appearance is what we call this. So symmetric bow tie appearance in the vertical meridian. There's no abnormal anterior elevation, no abnormal posterior elevation, no abnormal thinning on the pachymetry map. So this is just a steep cornea, but there is no ictasia. So this is just an astigmatism or a steep cornea. Now when we come to this third example, here we do have some asymmetry. If you see here what we call as the teardrop sign, so there is the inferior asymmetric steepening as compared to the superior steepening. There is anterior elevation here up to 32, posterior elevation and area of thinning which is clearly displaced from the central point and anti the elevation, the thinning and the steepening is coinciding. So this is a focal area of weakness causing steepening more suggestive of a keratoconic cornea. Again, this, is, this also shows a, a asymmetric steepening here, elevations and coinciding point of thinning. So again, keratoconus. This is more like a spot diagnosis, what we call as the kissing pigeon sign or the crab claw appearance in a PMCD. So here you have a kissing pigeon sign, you have peripheral elevations and thinning is usually not picked up very well on these topography maps because the thinned out area is quite peripheral and is not picked up in the 8 to 8.5 millimeters that the pentacam picks up. So this is a pellucid marginal degeneration, okay? And this is again the classic butterfly wing sign that you see in a PMCD. So this again is a pellucid marginal degeneration. The keratometry, uh, sorry, yeah, the keratometry map will show this butterfly wing sign here. So you have crab claw appearance in the previous map and you had the butterfly wing sign in the in this map that you are seeing. Rashmi, so uh, you would like to cover both the topics or you'll... I'll be covering uh, ocular surface basic tests. Sir. No, you have around five to seven minutes more that's why I said. Yeah, so after examples topography is done yes, okay. and then the main tests is what I'm covering for Dr. Soham Basak's talk. Okay. And again, then this one, this one, this map has a flattened keratometry uh, map, if you see. So there's a flattening here, but there is no elevation on either of the maps. And then there is a corresponding thinning. So this is an example of a post-refractive surgery cornea because it has been ablated. So it will become flat and it will be depressed. And it will be thinned out. So what are the uses of topography? It helps in differentiating the normal astigmatism from ictatic disorders, diagnosing ictasias. Also monitoring the progression of ictatic diseases, screening before refractive surgeries, whether there are any abnormal ictatic problems, and also a supplement to biometry to look at the corneal astigmatism. So thank you for that. And now I'll just quickly cover the uh, tests for ocular dry eye disease. Yeah. 
So evaluation of a patient with dry eye disease, I'm just going to cover the basic tests in this. So we know the normality of film, it has mucin layer, aqueous layer, and lipid layer. Dry eye disease can be caused either by reduced tear production or increased evaporation. Depending on that, it is aqueous deficiency or evaporative disease. Then what is ocular surface? Ocular surface comprises of a, fun uh, it is a uh, interface between the functioning eye and environment and it consists of palpebral and bulbar conjunctival epithelium, corneal epithelium and tear film and the adnexal structures. And this is what we need to test. So first would be taking the uh, history in terms of what symptoms the patient is experiencing. Then quantifying these symptoms is what is done with the help of questionnaires. So there are different dry eye questionnaires like the ocular surface disease index or the speed questionnaire and the McMoney's questionnaire. I'm going to skip this. And then in the physical examination, you should look at uh, how, what, uh, what are the facial features? Are there any signs of rosacea or floppulids? If there is any fre uh, infrequent blinking, what is the size of the palpebral up up aperture? And if there are any malpositions of lids? Again, a uh, slit lamp examination would include how the lid margins are, whether there is any thickening, scarring, and keratinization, if there are any misdirected eyelashes, keratinization of conjunctiva and cornea, whether there's any vascularization or panis on the cornea, and then tear film assessment for filaments and debris. And last but not the least, corneal sensations are important. Then uh, tear film stability is usually checked with the help of fluorescein dye installation, where usually you should use a non-preserved fluorescein drop. And the time between the last blink and the appearance of first break is your TBUT. There is also something called as non-invasive TBUT where a placebo image is projected on the tear film and then you look at the tear breakup here. So if there is a breakup in the image, that is how it picks up the first TBUT. That is a non-invasive, normal cutoff would be less than 10 seconds. Then vital dye staining, there is fluorescein, lysamine green, rose bengal. So in fluorescein staining, it usually is used for corneal staining more as compared to conjunctival and it is one to two percent of sodium fluorescein which is used and observed under cobalt blue filter. And what it does is it, it permeates the intercellular junctions uh, where the corneal epithelium is disrupted. So you can make out where the abrasions are and uh, corneal epithelial defects. Then in lysamine green staining, it is more uh, for the conjunctival staining. So it stains the dead and degenerated cells and stains conjunctiva better. When it comes to rose bengal dye, that uh, stains the ocular surface which is devoid of any mucus or where there is a devitalized cells. So that is where rose bengal dye staining is used. And tear film meniscometry is mainly to measure the slit lamp height and the average tear meniscus. Usually there is the, it is available in keratographs, but you can also use uh, you do the fluorescein staining in order to measure the tear film height. Height of less than 0.2 millimeters would be abnormal. Then coming to Schirmer's, so Schirmer's test is mainly for your aqueous component of your tear film, whether the aqueous component is uh, being produced or not. So there's a strip of filter paper which is placed in the lower conjunctival cul-de-sac and then you uh, look at the wetting over five minutes. So Schirmer's one measures your basal as well as re reflex secretions. S in Schirmer's two, you irritate the nasal mucosa with a cotton-tipped applicator and measure the reflex secretion. And Shermas 3 is now obsolete, but uh, it was when the subject was asked to stare at the sun. So a tear perning test is to look at whether the mucoid uh, component of the tear is normal or not. So in that the mucus forms, if the mucus is normal, it will form these kind of uh, ferns when it dries up. And if it is a dry eye, then there are no ferns which are seen. Uh, this is a classification called Rolando's classification where the type one and type two where there are ferns seen is normal. But if it, is, if it is a dry eye subject, then there'll be broken up ferns or there'll be no ferning at all. And then impression cytology is used to look at whether there is any metaplasia of the cell. So nitrocellulose filter paper is used on the area of interest to get in or the, for the idea of taking off some superficial two to three layers of cells. And then it is stained to look at the conjunctival goblet cells. Then in mybography, there is a contact my mybography which is not used these days, uh, but infrared mybography is what, which is, uh, is what is used. So in that, the ducts are hyperilluminescent. Uh, this is how the normal glands would appear, and this is how gland dropouts would appear. So you don't have any hyperilluminescence in this area where there is gland dropout. And then there is a scoring which is given. Like score zero, there is no loss. Less than one third loss would be score one. One third to two third is score two and score three is more than two thirds. 
and lastly like i mentioned corneal sensations are important they can be both cause as well as effect of dry eye and uh, i think myopometry and tear film osmolarity is something that i can skip so just to summarize evaluation of unhealthy ocular surface would involve a careful examination of symptoms as well as signs you can use dry eye questionnaires to objectively quantify the symptoms tear film analysis would be obviously important using vital dye stainings and fluorescein staining mybography to look at the mybobian glands impression cytology would give a picture about how the goblet cells and the conjunctival health is and whether there is any metaplasia and dysplasia and then newer diagnostic techniques include the tear film osmolarity and mybometry thank you very much uh, thank you dr rashmi uh, for a very you know eloquent uh, i mean uh, idea about corneal topography as well as covering dr soham's lecture thank you very much uh, if you do not have a, a mebography at in your place what will you do auto ref yes that's good oh, you can just use the auto refractometer you can just see it's also something that works like an infrared uh, mebography okay so if you have not used that please go back to your uh, i mean places avoid the lead and try to do an auto refractometer on that i mean not for refraction but for to check the mebobian glands you will be really surprised okay now it's time to invite i i deem it as my privilege to invite uh, dr arup chakraborty for the next talk so he's a celebrity ophthalmologist i'm a big fan of myself and uh, he is a master speaker very deft surgeon he has probably taught countless people to surg to acquire surgical ophthalmological skills he's a very articulate orator because the topic that's given to him actually requires one such man and a, a probably a quintessential part of uh, indian ophthalmology academia for last 3 4 decades uh, you must have heard of lot of names in the named eye oil formulae okay dr uh, chakraborty has probably been rubbing shoulders with all those legendary ophthalmologists because he is a man who is most known in the international fora as he represents indian ophthalmology at the international level so we have dr arup chakraborty from trivandrum from chakraborty eye care center who will be talking about probably the most important topic i told you uh, refraction is important for i mean exams and practice i will formulate it's going to be for today and tomorrow that is the most important thing you will be doing cataract surgeries we have scaled up the quality we have increased the aspirations of the patients and we are probably the refractive surgery has married cataract surgery now so you need to have a very clear understanding of what i will formulate actually now how it makes sense it's so difficult many a times you must have given seminars in your classrooms but nobody has understood somebody who knows more probably can only simplify can tell less so here dr arup will be talking about the very relevant very contemporary very important topic of biometry and eye power calculation sir in the next 15 minutes sir please do cover it <coughs> good morning friends uh, at the outset i'd like to thank uh, santosh for alerting a topic to me which is uh, some sort of a passion uh, for me and uh, thank you krishna prasad for uh, the very kind uh, introduction uh, i am just going to give you a brief overview of uh, intraocular lens power calculation target refraction etc because in the limited time available this is what i can do uh, to the best of my ability i would also request you to uh, enroll for uh, you know for the skill transfer courses that are going on where you will have hands on experience and on the various biometric devices because i'm not going to talk to you about any of these hardcore aspect the machine aspect of uh, my presentation or how to handle them so you have better attend a skill transfer school uh, transfer course for that uh, nothing financial though i'll be talking about couple of devices here now i'll start off with a real life uh, clinical scenario you know this happened to me uh, an elderly man uh, i had done a standard clear corneal temporal phaco 2.4 mm monofocal il right eye a patient had uh, uh, 66 and n6 with the glasses he was with the pseudo accommodation and when i operate on the second eye and the patient returned for glass prescription he was very very dissatisfied you know i mean this is so called refractive surprise actually it is such a good re refractive outcome you know with minus 0.75 he reads 66 and he requires uh, you know only two diopter to get n6 so 
uh, even without having a refractive surprise, you could have uh, uh, patients uh, you know, blaming you and, and feeling very dissatisfied because maybe in this case proper counseling was not given. He was not told that you know it is just a monofocal intraocular lens and uh, and uh, you need uh, pres uh, presbyopic. Uh, you'll have pseudopicic uh, presbyopia and you'll need correction for that. So this is what had happened. You know, the fellow I had was operated a long time back. So that time the pupil the the you know, pupil wasn't very small and it was not a very hard cataract, but when they operated on the left eye, people had become small, senile meiosis, and it was a hard cataract, I had to use iris uh, uh, hooks. And uh, as a result of that, you had a pupil which uh, was you know, traumatized, and perhaps that was responsible for it. So uh, you must realize that today, cataract surgery is a refractive uh, procedure. We want to hit the target refraction in each and every patient that we operate upon, and for most of the patients, the target refraction is plano 66. This is the holy grail. So this is where we intend to arrive in our journey, our destination, our goal. So where are we today? I mean, we need to assess where we are today so, so that we can chart out our journey. Before I go further, I would just uh, take a small quiz uh, from the postgraduates here. Can anybody identify this gentleman that you see on the screen? Postgraduates? Sir Harold Ridley? Why his name is written in letters of gold in Indian in, uh, international ophthalmology? Yeah, he implanted the first intraocular lens, you know, way back in 29 November 1949. Now, why I am uh, uh, talking about him? Because his uh, first two cases had a refractive error of minus 21 and minus 15 diopter. All right. And uh, subsequently, he incorporated a lot of changes. And still, the things did not, the refractive surprise did not go away. His um, uh, median post-op refractive error in his, uh, this uh, second cycle, which was audited, was minus 2.25 diopter. Again, you know, if you have this kind of refractive outcome for your patients today, you have to stop your practice. No patient is going to come, come to you. So, uh, so what are the target? What are we aiming for? See, if you look at the guidelines by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, the cataract surgery guidelines, 85% uh, of your post-op patients should land within one diopter of target refraction. But I think you know, we uh, in definitely can do better. And whatever I'm telling you is uh, from my personal experience, but I need to give you evidence. So this was an article uh, published uh, in JCR just two years back, where it was found that using all the modern formulas, a prediction error of minus, plus minus 0.5 diopter, that is post-operative post period, you are able to land a patient uh, within this range, you know, b between 88 to 90.67% of the patient, which is a phenomenal number. And with the older formulas also, the results were pretty good. So this is where we are heading for. Now, uh, for us to achieve the target refraction, it goes without saying that you, the surgery has to be very safe, no scope for any complication. You need to take care of the astigmatism, and uh, Tori Kyle is uh, what we do today to take care of uh, corneal astigmatism. Use a premium intraocular lens in a multifocal lens, any presbyopic correcting lens. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm sure there are you know, other speakers dealing with these topics uh, in the subsequent uh, you know, sessions. But what I'm going to talk to you is about the in how do you increase the refractive accuracy for IL power calculation. Now, before I start off my uh, talk, you know, I would like to pay tributes to these gurus of intraocular lens power. And you know, over the years, they have they had the publications, their presentations, and we have benefited a great deal from their uh, discourses. So I would like to acknowledge the role in my developing my presentation. So uh, when I was a postgraduate student and a couple of years after that also, you know, I used to think that IL power calculation is just in you know, one small tick that you uh, make on the, on the preoperative checklist. But then uh, I soon realized that and it is much, the IL power calculation is, is, a, is an experience altogether, you know, it spans the preoperative period, bulk of the action takes place in the preoperative period. And it also, uh, the events intraoperatively or postoperatively when you check the patient's vision and when you fine tune a surgery, that also plays a very important role. So you must not think that it is just a one-off incident in the, in the patient's life span. So preoperatively, I would like to know why the patient's vision is reduced, you know, because it may affect my biometry. Is the, does the patient have a very advanced cataract? Does the patient have a posterior staphyloma? Does the patient have amblyopia or fixation losses? I would also look at the, the ocular surface. And uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we have realized that an abnormal ocular surface can adversely impact 
the corneal measurements. The corneal measurements will be uh, will be off uh, that are off. I mean, off of what it actually is. You know, so whether uh, you do a spherical uh, cal do a cal calculation for a torical, you will be calculating the wrong axis. If you think calculating for a monofocal or a multifocal IL, you'll be calculating a wrong power. So make sure that ocular surface is properly examined preoperatively before you start your biometry. And if you find any defect in the ocular surface, any ocular surface disease, the ocular surface has to be optimized by proper therapy. And once the patient has uh, ocular surface optimized, you know, you do a series of biometric uh, evaluation and accept two consecutive repeatable values. So it takes about six to eight weeks for us to get a very stable uh, you know, uh, keratometry for these patients. Mill touch uh, biometry cannot be overemphasized. We need to perform all these uh, investigations on a virgin cornea, not on a cornea which has uh, had a lot of insults with you know, topical medications like you know, anesthetic drops, midriatic drops, uh, cyclopegic drops. So no prior contact procedure. Now sometimes what happens is in a patient is gets ready for cataract surgery at the end of the day after all the evaluations are over and by that time the cornea is really hazy and it is important for us to call the patient back on a different day with a virgin cornea and repeat the investigations. So once, uh, the, once you've ruled out the ocular surface issues, patient counseling is very important because not all patients want to read Plano 66. You know, they, some of them want to read with the glasses. Uh, uh, without, without glasses, intermediate distance or small or near distance. So all these things have to be ascertained before you set up your target reproduction. I always believe in performing biometry using uh, at least two devices and use more than one formula for IL calculations. Now regarding biometry, now what are the fact parameters that you're going to take? You know, you're going to measure the axial length, the K readings, anterior chamber depth, the white to white diameter and lens thickness. Most of the formulas uh, require these elements. So for the formulas to give you correct prediction, you have to ensure that what you measure is absolutely accurate. So uh, cornea can be measured in various ways. You could use a manual keratometer or an auto keratometer. I used to do it earlier and uh, now I don't do them. Then uh, must realize that you know optical biometry uh, has, it take, has taken over them I and we have started resorting to optical biometry, which is a multifunction device and it, it also me measures the cornea. And then uh, if you're going for a multifocal dial or a toric lens, it is a good idea to perform, to learn more about the cornea. Rashmi has spoken so well about uh, topography and other things and eye trace. So these are the things that I routinely do for all my uh, uh, preoperative patients. If the patient is wearing a contact lens, ensure that the patient is off the contact lens. If it is a hard contact lens, minimum of two weeks uh, before uh, biometry, the patient should be off uh, the contact lens. Uh, coming to the measurement of the axial length, uh, all of us have been doing uh, ultrasonic uh, biometry for a long time, the scan biometry. You know, so I just can't say that it, it is obsolete in our country. It's a we are a, in a developing world. So we definitely use A scan, but I would suggest that you go for an immersion A scan for your patients and not the contact carpenation. Because we have learned over the years, and there are a lot of publications supporting it, that a contact application, you know, a contact technique or apprenticeship technique is less accurate, and it usually re results in a shorter axial length, you know, by 0.25 to 0 0.33 millimeter. This problem can be, accuracy issues can be sorted out if you use an immersion A scan. Now, optical biometry is uh, what we do uh, routinely to measure the axial length. And uh, you know, we have uh, come a long way, uh, but more than two, two, two decades earlier, IL Master 500 was, uh, was launched in the market. And it gives a very accurate uh, axial length determination. And uh, so there, have been, there are always some naysayers. They say that you, know, you don't have to invest for optical biometry because you, you, have, you get good results with uh, you know, ultrasound biometry. But then I, I would again go back to evidence. You know, this is courtesy of Dr. Ulfgang Heigis. He was a mathematician, he's not an ophthalmologist. So he, these 11 publications clearly show the red bars that you see are, uh, are uh, you know, uh, IR Master 500, uh, the optical biometry. So accuracy level was much higher compared to when immersion biometry was done. So whenever you have an opportunity, please get use an optical biometer, particularly in situations where, you know, a patient it has a posterior phagoma or it is a post-vitrectomy eye with silicon oil inside the anterior in the, in the, in the posterior chamber segment. So these are the cases where you need to get a, a optical biometry done. 
uh, there have been new advances, you know, the swift source OCT devices have come up. So these devices have taken care of some of the limitations or, dr or, or drawbacks of the earlier optical biometers, which were using uh, the, the older um, design. So th the penetration is better. So these, these devices enable you to uh, get the axial length uh, in situations where the nucleus is very dense or if there, even if there's a thick postal subcapsular cataracts. Two more devices are being launched in the market, you know, Anterian from Heidelberg and Eistat 900. You know, these are, the, like, these are basically OCT devices which have been added to the optical biometer. I'll not be talking much uh, details. But plus, please remember, just because you have an optical biometer, it is not the end of the problem. You need to, it's not a magic wand that, you know, you put the patient on optical biometer and you get a, a perfect, accurate axial length. You have to ensure that the validation guidelines are followed. Uh, in your practice, when you start off, it is important that you do all your biometries. And as your practice grows and the number of patients improve, then you may delegate the responsibility to your optometrist or technicians, but you have to be in charge. You should know the latest, what is happening, what are the possible mistakes that can happen. And uh, uh, there are validation guidelines, you know, for example, there are certain guidelines that come up. This dish has to be stuck on the uh, biometry wall, room wall. And those values, suspicious values, dubious values have to be deleted and you have to take repeat measurements. So uh, now I have already spoken about the patient counseling that is important. Now, intraoperatively, what is uh, so important about it? You know, because it is again the expected lens position, you know, wherever the lens is going to rest. So today uh, we have to do a, I mean, we will do a cataract surgery through a 2.4 to 2.8 millimeter clear condyle temporal incision, make an excess which is not more than 5 to 5.5 millimeter in size, ensure that the lens uh, stays exactly within the capsular bag for your target refraction to really, for you to really materialize your target refraction. Postoperative period is the moment of truth. This is where you find out whether you have landed on the target or there has been any deviation from the target. And then subsequently you can fine tune your uh, biometric uh, evaluation and IL formula utilization. Okay, now coming back to the, coming, moving on to the formula. So yeah, I have just told you that you need to get very, very you know, pure uh, data, biometric values, and then they have to be put in the formulas. Most of the time, these formulas are already there in the software of the biometry machine device, whether it is an ultrasound device or it, whether it is an optical biometer. So please do not follow this generational classification of uh, you know formulas. You know it goes on to generation one, generation seven. This is so chaotic. You know this doesn't have any any method in it, and so we tend to follow this new classification system, which is based on the method of calculating IL power, or and the data they use for these calculations. Historical reflection based, when I was a PG student, my teachers used to use the 18 diopter lens for all patients. That is again obsolete, that should not be done. Regression formulas, SRK, SRK2, again should not be used, though unfortunately, SRK2 formula still happens to be present in many of these ultrasound biometry devices. Well, let's see, please remember that for eyes within the normal axial length range, most of the formulas give you pretty good results, but problems happen when you are dealing with extremes in the cornea, steep cornea, flat cornea, long axial length, short axial length, thick lens or thin, or not a very thick lens, etc., etc. So Virgin's formulas, they still hold sway, Holiday 1, SRKT, Hoffer Q, Holiday 2. Please remember that these formulas are more than 20, 30 years old, you know, they are the previous millennium. The, the phones that you are using to take the pictures, you know, so it's okay, you can continue to take the pictures, but these are purchased just a few years back. We are not using cell phones which are purchased in the previous millennium. All right, so why do we continue to use, please continue, I'm not stopping you, but this is just to tell you that, you know, all the contents will be captured. Uh, see, there is a t video which is capturing the screen, and this will be uploaded in the AS Editor Proceedings si website, and you can continue, there's no harm in continuing your pictures. So what I try to tell you, just an example, that we don't use old cell phones, we don't use old cameras, we don't use old comp laptops, nothing, you know, the cards. So uh, these are the current formulas, you know, which are definitely uh, giving us very good results. Barrett Universal 2 is my go-to formula. Hill RBF is a very nice formula. And then new kids on the block, the Kane formula, Evo formula, they have come up. Barrett Universal 2 is fortunately available free in this particular website. This is a whole calculation suite. All your IL requirements, you know, a patient, uh, a normal cornea or a post-refractive surgery cornea, toric IL or a non-toric IL, and a patient with who has a, a refractive surprise and you want to perform an IL exchange, maybe just uh, two, three minutes, IL exchange or 
you know, piggyback lane. So this particular uh, the formula will take, will take care of all your iron power requirements. And this fortunately can also be used for immersion A scan, but only thing is when you're using an A, immersion A scan value, biometric value, please ensure that you use an appropriate A constant. Any intraocular lens will have two constants. One is for the optical biometry, other is for the ultrasonic biometry. So you have to be very careful about you know, selection of the selection of the, the, you know, the IL constant, lens constant. Other formula is the Hill RBA formula. This is again a free at the ACRS site. This particular formula is a, it is a, the artificial intelligent based formula. And uh, uh, so version three was just released a couple of months back and it is also pr pretty accurate. I use multiple formulas uh, for any given case. For example, now this was an IOL, ex uh, the, this is a patient with an ICL, high myopia ICL and uh, cataract. So I had to remove the ICL and put do a cataract surgery. So my, uh, you know, Barrett gave me a calculation, IL power of two diopter. All the, all the other previous generation formulas gave me an IL power of three diopter. So I used the three diopter lens and ultimately I was pretty happy with the eventual outcome. Lens constant is very important, lens constant optimization. And if you're using Hill RBF, if you're using the Barrett formula, most of these online formulas, they have, you know, lens constants already optimized, already within the formula. All right, so today, individually, A constant, lens constant optimization may not be required because uh, these are already available. But if it is a new lens, then I would start up using a manufacturer's A constant, which is put on the lens box. So friends, uh, in summary, uh, as far as IL power cal calculation is concerned, uh, please remember you are the boss. If something goes wrong, ultimately you are held responsible. So it is your responsibility to ensure that uh, all uh, precautions have been taken and a proper workup has been done. Use appropriate measurement devices, depending upon the setup that you practice. Use validated measurements, wrong measurements, you know, doubtful measurements should be deleted and I should be remeasured. Use the newer formulas, work with properly optimized lens constants adapt to new technologies as they present instead of harping on the same theme that technology, uh, new technology is just a ben benefit for the vendors. Most of the time it is not that, you know, I mean, so you need to be proactive and take ado and adopt and absorb the new technologies as and when they present and strive to use all available resources to the best advantage. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I think I have just done a minuscule. Please attend the, the, the skill transfer courses where you will have a hands-on experience in all these biometric devices and more about, you know, I'll put calculation perhaps in those halls. Thank you so much. How many are uh, postgraduate students here? Can I see a show of hands? It's a good number, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very eloquent, uh, you know, uh, lecture on a very important topic, actually. I think it's not just postgraduate. Everybody has something to learn from this talk because this is never expanding. And somebody like only Dr. Arup can do justice. Thank you very much once again, sir. So I call upon the next speaker. Dr. Chintan Malhotra. She is the associate uh, professor uh, who is in the Department of Cornea, Cataract and Refractive Services from PGI Chandigarh. So she is a very well known uh, teacher and an academician, and she has trained hordes of students, and she is one of the authorities in the anterior segment. And she will be talking about a very important uh, topic, the specular microscopy essentials. <laughs> Just like Dr. Arup talked about uh, the biometry, which is a very important part of cataract surgery. I think uh, specular microscopy with the corneal endothelial health is going to be so important, both for cornea uh, hardcore uh, specialists as well as for cataract surgeons. So this is a shared interest. And she will be telling about the very basics of uh, how to understand a specular microscopy, especially for the postgraduates. Dr. Chintan, please. Uh, thank you, sir. And I'd like to thank AIOS as well as Dr. Honavar for this opportunity. It's wonderful to see uh, such a full hall before the conference actually begins. And I think like uh, Dr. Krishna Prashad mentioned, uh, specular microscopy, uh, you cannot really practice cornea without uh, having a good uh, view of the endothelium. This specular microscopy is one of the ways to look at the endothelium. Of course, uh, nothing can replace your clinical examination uh, where you have the uh, specular reflection and uh, you see the endothelium. After that, where needed, one should go in for specular microscopy. Can you have my presentation? So we'll be having some time in the end for the questions and any interaction, okay? So if you have any doubts about any topic that has been covered, so please be ready. We'll just have some time for the interaction also.
anyway the speaker for the next session dr sumit lahan is here still we will try to cover that okay i'm sorry for the delay you can connect the pen drive otherwise uh, so how many of you here have access in your colleges to a specular microscope can you show us your hands the students i meant here yeah. okay so that's around 50% i think you do have uh, access to the specular microscope because often you'll see that the patients uh, uh, do come with images even if you don't have access to it and you know uh, with our post graduates also there are a series of numbers and images and one just ends up getting confused this was checked in the beginning so i again apologize for somehow it's not connecting If you do not have specular microscope, how will you evaluate the endothelium? Huh? Slit lamp, specular? No, tell the full name. No. No, no. By microscopy, slit lamp. What will you see? Specular reflection. How many of you have done actually specular reflection? Genuine. Okay, answer. How many of you have seen endothelium on slit lamp? Raise your hands. Dr. Chintan, you have a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfectly okay, I think, because it does take time to start seeing the endothelium. Uh, I must admit, I think for the first, my three years of uh, residency, I hardly ever saw the endothelium. And it's only a few years later that you start seeing it. Whenever anybody asks you, you always do say yes i'm seeing it but actually you've never seen it right <laughs> so it uh, does take time and this is going to take time maybe dr shamila you could take your talk uh, i don't know why they can't seem to connect is it connected now yeah okay thank you yeah so i'll just go on straight away to the thing so specular um, microscopy is basically the imaging modality to view the corneal endothelium in a clinical setting or an eye bank setting you can have it in both settings and it's based on the same principle as you have in clinical specular microscopy, where you see the endothelium. That is, it's based on the principle of specular reflection. So the angle of refracted light makes an equal angle with the incident light, and it is only that light which can be seen, picked up by the specular microscope, and which is seen. And before I go ahead with the rest of the presentation, all the, the images I have of, of my own patients, but this is an excellent article in IGEO. It's a review article by Dr. Uh, Charas, Sunita Charasya and Dr. Vanati, which gives you all the... Uh, uh, Details of specular microscopy. So I would recommend that you go through it. If you go through that, you don't really need to go through anything else. So basically what happens is that the incident light passes through the cornea. Now the cornea is not a single surface. It has a series of interfaces which are optically distinct, have different refractive indices. Most of the light gets transmitted. Some of it is absorbed and some of it is reflected back. The light which falls on the posterior corneal surface, a very minuscule part of that is reflected back. And this reflected light, which is reflected specularly, is then captured by the specular microscope and forms the endothelial image. So it's a even less than, much less than 1%. Now, just to have a little bit of an idea, specular microscopes can be classified in different ways. We can have, mostly we have in our clinics are the non-contact specular microscopes, which because the cornea is curved, cover a smaller area, or you can have the contact as well. And then you can have the horizontal specular microscopes. For example, this is a clinical specular microscope, and this is a specular microscope used in the eye bank, where you have to evaluate the corneoscleral limbs. A quick view of this, I have no financial interest. Basically, this machine is very easy to use. Any specular microscope, you use it almost like an autoref. It takes very little time to capture, and the optical magnification is close to 200 times, and which is why you can see the cell so well. And once you have captured the image, the endothelial characteristics can be seen. So we need to evaluate the endothelium both in terms of qualitative uh, parameters as well as the quantitative parameters, the numbers as well as the quality of the endothelium. And the evaluation, I thought I'd come to this later, but since my, this presentation didn't work, there are various ways in which you can calculate the endothelial cell density. I won't go into the uh, details of that in the beginning. But you have a frame method where you have a frame which is put up. This may be a fixed frame or a variable frame. You can adjust the area, and then you can have the cell count taken from it. 
The disadvantage of this is that some of the cells which are at the border may get missed out and you may not get very accurate uh, cell counts. And for in these cases, the variable frame method is better, right? Then you have something known as, so this is the example, this was of an adult patient donor, this is 31 years, these are eye bank images actually. And you see this is a donor as a five year old child and you see the cell count is so much higher, right? And you can see that on the thing also. And then you have the other methods where you have the flexi center method where you combine a variable frame and you can take the individual cells. This also can be taken up in multiple frames and here you can get it. So this upper thing is showing the average. You get an average because some areas may have more cells, some may have less cells and you can get an average of that, right? So I'll come now to the clinical specular microscopy. Now interpreting a specular image in the correct context is important. So you cannot take anything out of context. It has to be interpreted in the clinical context as well as in the context of what other pathologies or comorbidities the patient has. So for that, it's important to know that the normal endothelium is a single layer and it's made of polygonal cells, mostly hexagonal. And the reason why cells are hexagonal is because that is the most efficient shape, which provides a maximum area, right? So most of the cells are hexagonal. And also once endothelial cells are damaged, usually they do not, they have poor regenerative uh, capacity. So it's not that they don't have any regenerative capacity at all. We are now learning that peripheral cells do have some regenerative capacity, but it's a very limited capacity. And if you lose cells in the center, it's usually the migration of the cells which comes to cover up that area. And so the cell count would go down and your cell shapes would become, uh, they would not be remain so healthy, right? So this is the example. This is in fact the pictures of one of my own residents only. This is a healthy endothelium. You see this and the residents are always confused. What numbers are these? How many of you know here? Raise hand. So I'll take you through these one by one, right? So this number that you see is the number of cells which have been evaluated. 312 in the right eye and 323 in the left eye. It's only the number of cells which have been evaluated. From these number of cells, depending on the area that was taken, this is an automated analysis. You are getting the cell density. So the cell density is above 3000 and it's in cells per millimeter square. Next you have the average, this is, so this is the average cell area. So average cell area is 300 close, just close to 300 in both eyes. Following this, you have the standard deviation. So how many of these cells are deviating in size from the mean? I'll come to the importance of that later. And then next is the coefficient of variation. This is one of the most important parameters. So the coefficient of variation tells you basically how variable the cells are in terms of their size and which is also an indirect measure of their function. For example, in this, the coefficient of variation is calculated by the standard deviation divided by the average size multiplied by 100. So that's 94 here multiplied by, uh, sorry, that's 94 divided by uh, 29, uh, 329 and uh, sorry, 34 divided by 329, that is the 28.57, right? Then you have the maximum cell area. This is the minimum cell area. And then the other important parameter is the percentage of hexagonal cells. So I, like I mentioned, most of the cells are hexagonal. And this parameter gives you out of all the cells that were measured, how many cells were uh, observed to be hexagonal. And so this is a measure of the hexagonality and which is why its name is given 6A. So these two, the highlighted in the orange, the CV and the 6A are two, if you have to have a quick look at the endothelium, these are the two parameters you look at to see whether the endothelium is functioning well or not. Now you see here, there are different ways in this. They're just ways of showing the same image in different ways. So here we have the raw photo, the raw data. In the next image, uh, you have the trace. So it's just traced out the boundaries of the cells. Right? In the next you have the area, right? And so these are all the same numbers which you saw on that first slide, but here this is giving you a photographic representation of the cells in area. So they're shown in different colors. There's no need to get confused with that. A particular size, a particular range is given in a different color, right? And here this is the one which is showing you the area. So a change in area is known as polymegatism, especially if the cells become larger, right? And so a lower coefficient of variation implies that fewer cells are either very large or very small. That means most of them are optimal. And the normal CV is taken as 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, or you can take it as 20 to 30 if you multiply it by 100, because you'll get it in different values. And more than 0.4 is usually considered abnormal. Now, it's not that the endothelium is dysfunctional, but it's a sign of 
slowly progressing dysfunction and long-term contact lens where diabetes mellitus, you have inflammation in the eye, all these can lead to a relatively higher coefficient of radiation. And the same image again represented by this one. So here it's the colors are showing you the cells which were detected, which are five-sided cells, which are six-sided cells. And so here it's showing you that it's a healthy endothelium. Close to 60% of the cells are hexagonal. All cells cannot always be hexagonal. There are lots of stressors of the environment as well as age-related changes. And so a count above 60 to 70 is considered usually good, right? CV is a sensitive indicator of endothelial dysfunction. If you have a very high CV, it shows you that the endothelium is a little dysfunctional. Hexagonality, on the other hand, is more of an indicator of endothelial repair. So it's been shown that if you have different shaped cells, that doesn't necessarily correlate with a badly functioning endothelium. But like I mentioned, the more the cells migrate, the more the shape will change. So you could say that a low coefficient of variation and a high 6A value are biomarkers of a healthy endothelium per se. That's what's important to remember. Clinically speaking, specular microscopy is used in endothelial pathologies. So you have primary pathologies which affect the endothelium, for example, the Fuchs endothelial dystrophy and ICE syndrome, PPCD. And then you could have any inflammation which affects or any man manipulations like, for example, post-surgery. These would affect the endothelium and these would be classified as secondary endotheliopathies. Now this is the image which one sees most classically. So this is Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. You need to be able to see these gutte on the slit lamp as well. If you don't, specular microscopy comes to your aid, right? So these are areas of dropout. And these areas appear dropped out because uh, the gutte are basically excrescences of the decimate membrane into the endothelium. Normally, the endothelium reflects back light, some part of it, but the light passes through these gutte, and which is why they are appearing dark. They are not appearing bright, right? And you see multiple gutte of various sizes. Some are larger than the endothelium, some are smaller than the endothelium, and I've just shown this. So the cell density, while the cell density is still fairly good, above like 23, the CV is very high, and you're seeing that the coefficient of variation is low. So the, at this stage, the patient may still have a good clear cornea, but down the line, it will decompensate, especially if you're doing surgery, you need to be careful. And gutte can be staged based on their size. So if, whether it's smaller than the endothelial cell, bigger than the endothelial cell, or they coalesce, right? So you have different shapes of gutte. And in some patients, you may have some images which are non-analyzable. So here you have large gutte, but the cornea is clear. And in some cases, you may have a non-analyzable image, which may be due to confluence of the gutte, right? So you need to be able to see that. This I've already mentioned. Corneal gutte may also be seen in some other conditions. So actual gutte you may see in also macular dystrophy, not only in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. They're not pathognomic of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. And the other thing is, anytime you have something on the endothelium which blocks light, you would see that as dark out areas. For example, in pigment dispersion syndrome or uveitis, if you have pigment, those cells would not be seen, which is why I said a clinical specular correlation is important. And also, if you have uveitis, the cells can appear swollen and they can appear like pseudogutte. They can appear darker than the normal cells. So a clinical correlation. The other condition which I find uh, specular microscopy very useful is an ICE syndrome, the iridocorneal endothelial syndrome. So this is a patient who was referred to the glaucoma uh, from the, we often get patients referred from the glaucoma clinic. Sometimes the clinical diagnosis of Fuchs versus ICE can be a little confusing because both will show you a hammered silver reflex on the endothelium, right? Sometimes, although the other features are different. And you see the specular reflex shows, so this was a typical ICE cell which was classically described for the ICE condition on specular microscopy. You see that the normal endothelium is bright and the intercellular borders, the borders are dark. But in an ICE, it becomes reverse, which is known as the light dark reversal. And it is known as the cell surface is dark and the intercellular junctions are light. So that's very classic. And this image is kind of almost very classic of an ICE syndrome. And here, the same patient again, we can see the normal eye has a much higher cell density, whereas the ICE syndrome, the cell density is lower and all the biomarkers, I mean kind of markers, specular markers are altered. Dr. Chintan, I think uh, we have a little time left. Okay, uh, yeah. Am crossed. I? Yeah, you're done with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll, so I'll just finish that. And so this is a patient of uveitis where you see much less cells, right? And with a patient with Fuchs heterochromic uveitis. So I'll just finish that. Clini specular microscopy is clinically useful in many scenarios. So you see endothelial pathology, primary or secondary. Then following up the health of corneal transplants. As you 
do corneal transplantation over years the cell count decreases to see the health of corneal transplants or status post rejection determining the suitability of eyes for corneal transplantation for a dmec or a dsec you need much higher cell counts than the uh, for penetrating keratoplasties and decision making also for in cases of fuchs endothelial dystrophy if you have low cell counts and a significant cataract you might decide to go in for a combined surgery vis-a-vis -vis if the cell counts are reasonable so it can help you in your clinical decision making and the last thing I think is the slide is not there. Confocal microscopy is another view to see the endothelium. That's a perfect way to see the endothelium at higher magnifications as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chintan. I think it was a very lucid presentation. Even I learned a lot from the uh, from this talk. I think it probably should spark off a, an idea for all of you to look into the, your patient's corneas in a much more, you know, uh, uh, elaborate manner. Uh, how to clinically as well as you know to by through investigations evaluate the corneal endothelium both in health and disease okay this is a very important point just now for a cornea disease for any patient undergoing cataract surgery which is the most common thing you should always try to see because eyes won't see what the mind doesn't know so if you have to do a checklist try to look at there so before uh, dr sharmila starts like how do you actually evaluate a cornea in a routine cataract surgery evaluation just anybody on a state lab not specular okay you said that madam has given you a leeway of another one more year to look at it okay so how do you just like what are the signs symptoms and signs of an early endothelial decompensation or a poor endothelial count because you may be looking at staring at a disaster you may do a cataract surgery patient may end up with uh, problems okay i think we'll finish after dr sharmila so I welcome uh, Dr. Sharmila. Dr. Sharmila is a, a very senior ophthalmologist. She is actually a senior assistant professor from the RIO GOH, the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Chennai. And she's the present editor of uh, Tamil Nadu Journal of Ophthalmology. And she's a very uh, uh, prolific surgeon, well known teacher, and a postgraduate teacher. And today she is here to share some of the Cornea X files, as the name suggests. So we're going to really look for some very interesting and a very uh, you know, uh, problematic cases in cornea. So, from none other than Dr. Uh, Sharmila Devi. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, sir, for the very kind introduction. My topic is cornea X files. So, it will be just a case based scenario. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we have a packed hall, so it would have been nice if it had been an interactive session, but for want of time, I think we have to rush. Uh, so, I'll start off with a very common case. I think uh, everyone will be getting a keratitis case for your examination. It can be bacterial, fungal, viral, or acanthamoeba. Uh, so what many PGs do is they start off with an ocular examination and they start describing the lesion. So that is not the way to go. You have to do a complete ophthalmic evaluation and uh, uh, you have to look for ectropion, entropion, mevomitis. And unless you look for it, you will definitely miss a lag of thalmus. And many times, lag of thalmus, nocturnal lag of thalmus, all of it is missed because we don't look for it and uh, uh, any uh, neurotrophic keratitis and evaluation of the tear film is again very important. I think Dr. Rashmi Deshmukh uh, uh, clearly uh, showed you how to evaluate the ocular surface. It's very important to do all of this and uh, do a comprehensive evaluation before you present the case. Uh, so this is how you go about it. You should also look at the proptosis and um, any amount of exposure is there and you should see the forehead. So don't just look at the eye per se, look at the face look at the forehead, look at the tip of the nose, and your examination should start from the way the patient walks into the clinic. Uh, so another common question which is asked in exam is the differentiation between a bacterial keratitis and a fungal keratitis. And on the right, you see a dry, dirty looking ulcer and an elevated epithelial plaque. And here you see a creamy separative lesion and you can see the lid margin. There is some pus pointing and that is a point of contact with the cornea. I am sure uh, all of you will answer saying that you know the, uh, the symptoms are more in case of a bacterial keratitis than signs and why is it so can anyone answer why is it so i'm not asking my pgs because i've been asking them so many times <laughs> so this again is a very common question which is asked and the co common answer given is uh, the symptoms are more but why because uh, prajna sir has a very nice explanation for it uh, bacteria is a very small organism and uh, uh, neutrophils attack the bacteria very soon. The inflammatory cascade is set rolling, whereas in uh, fungi, fungi is a bigger organism and uh, it takes some time for the organism to settle down and the inflammation cascade to uh, start off. So that's the reason. And uh, these are different signs of fungal keratitis. 
and uh, you should be knowing all of it. And what is more specific among these for uh, fungal keratitis? Which one is more specific for fungal keratitis? Feathery edges are the most commonest. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's like a very specific feature for fungal keratitis. And I would also recommend you to read this uh, review article and uh, the MUT1 and MUT2 trial by Dr. Prashna. It's very important to classify the corneal ulcer also into mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, because when you classify it as severe corneal ulcer based on the size of the ulcer and the depth of the ulcer, uh, then again, your protocol and management protocols might differ because for a severe corneal ulcer, according to the TST protocol popularized by Dr. Namrata Sharma, ma'am, we might have to add some more agents. Uh, so it's very important to classify it accordingly. And uh, before you go for exams, uh, you should go through the MUT1 and 2 trial. And uh, what is the conclusion of the MUT1 trial? Septate filamentous fungi are the most commonest causes of fungal keratitis. In, uh, in North India, it is aspidilis, and South India, it is uh, uh, fusarium. And uh, natamycin works very well against them. And uh, orikinosol should never be used as a monotherapy. That is the conclusion given in MUT1 trial. And you should also know about the TST protocol, which is a topical, specific, and targeted therapy protocol given by Namrata Sharma, ma'am. And uh, for severe cases, what they do is addition of an oral orikinosol uh, or a ketoconosol, uh, which is not recommended by the MUT2 trial. They say that the oral antifungals are not very effective. Uh, but this is the TST protocol. And then uh, also intracameral and um, intrastromal antifungals. Uh, you should also know about uh, PAX-EXL for fungal keratitis and the recent one, the Rose Bengal uh, photodynamic uh, therapy for uh, fusarium keratitis. Uh, so these are things that you should uh, touch up, uh, I mean, uh, refer before you go for examinations. The classification of fungi, again, it's, uh, it's important from a PG point of view. And uh, what is more important is, uh, you know, before septate filamentous fungi were very, uh, uh, were the ones that we read upon mostly, and uh, after the mucor epidemic, uh, even the non-septate filamentous fungi became very popular. Now of uh, interest is this uncertain classification, Pythium insidiosum. So how do you make a diagnosis of Pythium when, um, uh, when, you, when you put the patient in antifungals and the patient doesn't respond to the antifungal therapy? And then when you see this pinpoint type of uh, infiltrates and tentacular projections and a peripheral gutter, then you think of uh, Pythium keratitis. Uh, the treatment is different, uh, so you have to put the patient on linosolid and oral astromycin for this patient. Uh, the case two, uh, how will you describe this case? So you have a papillary lesion here. You have vessels of different caliber entering into the, uh, so you have vessels of different caliber entering into the lesion and uh, it does is, it is involve the uh, limbal stem cells and it's straddling the cornea. So it's a di uh, the diagnosis is very clear cut. It's ocular surface commerce neoplasia. So you can have different varieties. The morphologically it can be leukoplakic, gelatinous, papilliform and pigmented. Uh, with this pigmented type of OSSN, can be differential diagnosed for a corneal melt with iris tissue incarceration or even melanoma. So you should be very careful in evaluating it. And uh, again, uh, you should go uh, do a step-by-step -step approach and uh, make a note of the vascularity, uh, describe the vessels which are entering into the lesion, look for any keratinization and uh, ocular surface staining with rose bengal. If you see keratinization and if you see an ocular surface uh, staining with rose bengal, which is positive, that is very, very specific for an ocular surface commerce neoplasia. Uh, impression cytology doesn't have much value in the area of anterior segment OCT, but uh, you can do it even for small lesions. Uh, before you interpret an abnormal AS OCT, you should be knowing how a normal AS OCT will look like. And uh, you, what you see here is a thin hyperreflective tear film, and then you have a hypodense, uh, hyperreflective area, which is the epithelium, and then the corneal stroma and the endothelium. So here, what you see is a normal epithelium, which is hyperreflective, and then you have the sudden transition into a hyperreflective and thickened epithelium, which is very, very characteristic of ocular surface commerce neoplasia and anterior segment OCT. Uh, anterior segment OCT, you should also be able to differentiate it from other uh, conditions like uh, conjunctival lymphoma, conjunctival amyloidosis, and conjunctival melanoma, which are all subepithelial. Uh, whereas uh, conjunctival nevus, you'll have lots of cystic spaces here. Uh, there's an image from AO, you can refer that. Uh, so before, uh, you should also be able to classify the grades of OSS and histopathology uh, because the uh, treatment protocols are going to be different for uh, this category, which is where there's a breach of the basement membrane. And up to this, the pro uh, treatment protocols are different. So what we do, uh, an excision biopsy is not just an excision biopsy, which you do for other lesions. Uh, so you should follow the no-touch technique, and it's called the shield six-step technique. 
where you delineate the uh, delineate the uh, margin of the lesion on the conjunctiva it's 4 mm on the uh, on the cornea it is 2 mm and you do a alcohol keratoepitheliectomy and uh, the next step is you do a conjunctiva tenonectomy a lamellar keratectomy a lamellar sclerectomy for 0.2 mm and then you do the reverse cryotherapy which is uh, double free stock cryotherapy to the posterior conjunctival margin uh, conjunctival edges and the base and amniotic membrane grafting to uh, reconstruct and that's how you draw the diagram and you can uh, uh, mark the lesion and send it for HPE. So what are the indications for topical chemotherapy? Uh, this question is again asked uh, very frequently. Uh, so if you have a corneal OSSN with visual axis involvement, if you have more than six clock hours limbal involvement, and if you have very small lesions, or if the base or edges are positive on HPE, then uh, those are indications for topical chemotherapy. Uh, you should be knowing about the agents which are used for chemotherapy. Uh, so this is again given by uh, Santosh and our sir, uh, the classification uh, based on histopathology and the treatment protocols. Uh, so if you have an invasive type of uh, uh, OSSN with a positive margin, then you have to re-excise. With a positive base, then you have to go for a plaque brachytherapy. Like I told you before, if the visual axis is involved, then we uh, do a pre-op adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we use mitomycin C in our hospital, but if the patient is affordable, then the patient can go for interferon alpha. Um, this case is a case of severe VKC. I think you can give the answers as well, uh, but for want of time, I'm just uh, running off. So this is a case of severe VKC. So you have the pa palpable conjunctiva involvement, the bulbar conjunctiva involvement, and you can see the limbal involvement, limbitis, horn atrentus, dots with a partial limbal stem cell deficiency. So you should be able to document in this, in this manner the number of papillae. Uh, so that's how you go about it. And uh, again, allergic eye disease is spectrum. So you should, it starts in the milder varieties and goes to the severe varieties. Uh, so you should be knowing about the different spectrums, uh, spectrum of uh, the disease and the step ladder pattern uh, for the management protocols, which starts from uh, mast cell stabilizers and lubricants, topical cyclosporin, topical tacrolimus, eye ointment, and it can go up to oral. Some patients, pediatric cases, we use oral corticosteroids and uh, also supratarsal injections of triamcinolone. Uh, so this case is, again, a uniocular chemical injury. So what you see here is a limbal stem cell deficiency. So why do you call limbal stem cell deficiency? Because you have loss of corneal clarity. You have vascularization of the cornea. The, there is pannus over the cornea. And uh, uh, you can hear, see a limbal frond here. So it's a uniocular chemi chemical injury, and some cases are bilateral chemical injuries. So this child was a case of uniocular chemical injury, and... Uh, uh, he had a timely amniotic membrane grafting done for him. So you can see the nice pannus here, nice pannus here and uh, similar front here. So what was done for him was a conjunctival limbal autograft and a slit, a simple limbal epithelial transplant. Uh, this, uh, limbal stem cells were taken from the other eye uh, because it's a uniocular injury. So it's an auto slit. If it is a bilateral uh, uh, chemical injury, then we have to take uh, the limbal stem cells from a cadaveric donor and then you have to do it up uh, with immunosuppression. So preoperatively, we have to do, follow the immunosuppression. And then postop again, uh, the immunosuppression has to be continued. Uh, that's the limbal dermoid. Uh, limbal dermoids can be kept as a spotter. Uh, so you have to uh, really grade the limbal dermoid properly. The amount of astigmatism has to be calculated. You can do an ASOCT and document the extent, extent and the uh, depth of involvement, whether it's 100 microns or more than that. And based on that, your treatment protocols uh, vary, uh, whether you just want to do an amniotic membrane grafting for it or uh, you want to do a lamellar patch graft for it. So this case was a golden heart syndrome for whom we did a lamellar patch graft. Uh, this is a case of uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis. And uh, as we talk about PUK, we have uh, the PUK expert walking in here. So uh, we, have, uh, we have an area of thinning here, and uh, uh, we have a stromal melting here. This is a lamellar patch graft. Uh, done for the case of PUK. So the first investigation that you should do for a case of PUK is uh, a smear. We have to rule out infectious causes. And uh, again, we have to do a complete uh, workup. Uh, systemic uh, collagen vascular disorders have to be ruled out, and 34% of the cases can be rheumatoid arthritis. And what is more specific for rheumatoid arthritis is not just RA factor. Uh, we have anti-CCP, so that should be done for, uh, uh, for these cases. And this is again is a very common question which is asked by examiners. Why is it more common in the periphery? Uh, you have to, I think you can take a, a picture of this, I mean a photo of this uh, slide. This is why it's very important in the periphery. 
the IgM and Langan cells and antigen presenting cells are all very high in the periphery. Uh, so again, uh, if there is no systemic cause and it's, uh, Moodens is just a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, so if you rule out all of the other causes, then it can be Moodens. Uh, you should be knowing about uh, the Watson's criteria for uh, Moodens uh, ulcer, the bilateral aggressive Moodens, the bilateral uh, indolent uh, Moodens ulcer in, uh, uh, in old age. So this, these talks are there in uh, YouTube, that's what uh, Arub sir said. Uh, it'll be there in, uh, I think, uh, editor proceedings. So I think uh, instead of taking pictures, you can also see there. So what are the indications for immunosuppression and PUK? Uh, so we have PUK unresponsive to aggressive conventional medical and surgical therapy, uh, progressive bilateral uh, PUK, one-eyed patient, or lethal systemic vasculitic syndromes of uh, corneal perforations. Uh, then we can uh, start the patient on immunosuppressants. And you should be knowing about the immunosuppressants used for these cases, and you can refer that paper for immunosuppression in PUK. So these are the treatment options available. You can do an amniotic membrane grafting. You can do a, a lamellar patch graft. First, you start off with a conjunctival uh, uh, resection. And immunosuppression is very, very important, and I would recommend you to read that paper on immunosuppression by the uh, LVPI group. Uh, these are all corneal perforations of different etiologies, so it can be an intrinsic pathology or an extrinsic pathology. Uh, this patient was a firecracker injury. Uh, this patient was a firecracker injury. Would have gone for corneal decompensation if we hadn't uh, done an intervention for him. So what are the treatment options available for corneal perforations? You can do a tissue adhesive with uh, uh, cyanoacrylate glue. You can do a multilayered amniotic membrane grafting. You can do a patch graft. Or you can do a tenons patch, which is the new kid on the block. So we've done a tuck and tee on patch with, uh, uh, for this case, and this patient had a good visual acuity. He had a cataract, and then he was uh, later operated for it. Uh, so this is a, a technique which is uh, popularized by Namrata Sharma Ma'am and Vajpayee, and this overlay which is was given by Dr. Sain Basu. Uh, again, dystrophies also will be kept as exam uh, cases. You should be knowing about the different types of stromal dystrophies, uh, how to differentiate one from the other. So that is a granular, you have the breadcrumb appearance. And how do you differentiate it from a macular? Because the intervening spaces are clear, whereas here it is, um, it's all hazy and it extends up to the mid-periphery. Uh, and you should be knowing about this mnemonic. Uh, Marilyn Monroe always gets her money in LACT. Why money instead of men? Because some examiners can be conservative. Uh, so you can uh, just put it as money. So you should definitely know this mnemonic and uh, go buy it. Uh, that again is a spotter that can be uh, kept as a spotter. It's a blood staining of cornea. Uh, post uh, firecracker injury, uh, the patient went for a blood staining of cornea because the intraocular pressure was not controlled well. And so this patient was take, taken for a DSEC, or you can even take it for an OKP. Uh, the last slide, so that is a case of hydrox. You can see the DM tear on the ASOCT and the aqueous seeping into it and uh, causing a, a hazy cornea. So what was done for this case was a pneumodesmetopexy with compression sutures. I think ectatic disorders are covered in a separate uh, session, so I'll wind up with that. Thank you. Dr. Sharmila, I think uh, that was a very good presentation on a very important aspect. You covered probably most of the uh, <laughs> difficult aspect of cornea in such a short time. Thank you very much. I think uh, we're almost left Thanks. with no time, maybe just last one minute. Uh, I think probably we had some things to discuss. Anyway, we are going to give the, I mean, uh, the session to the next uh, set of speakers already come in now. I think only thing is just uh, Dr. Arup's uh, talk. Uh, see, four things are important. If you do not have an eye-wall master or any kind of an optical biometer, it's fine. But see that when you do a keratometry, okay, see that it's a virgin cornea, no drops or no contact procedure has been done. If it is done, you please repeat it on the next day. And patients who are very short or very tall, when they reach up to the keratometer, they normally tend to tilt the head, you know, to fit themselves into that particular height. So that can cause a change in the axis. It's not about only the power, the keratometry values, it's also the axis. If the patient is turning his head by 20 degrees, you'll get an axis wrongly and probably you'll plan a toric or something, or maybe you'll plan your incisions, uh, I mean, in a different way. So make sure that the head is absolutely erect, Okay, it is, uh, I mean, aligned to the horizontal or vertical axis properly. And the third thing is, if you do not have any optical biometer, still please do an immersion A scan. That is something very basic that you can do in every situation. Try to get a Prager shell and try, just try to do an immersion, which is as good in most cases. And try to use the formula available. When you are doing that, you need to also measure the lens thickness and make those points in the immersion A scan. 
and try to use and uh, go to any APRS or ESCRS website. And try to use the Barrett Universal 2, which is available free for all of us, so that you can probably make it up for not having an optical biometer and your good results as good as having an optical biometer. That is something minimum that you can do in every case uh, from your practice. So thank you very much. I thank. Uh, uh, another point, uh, I think uh, evaluation of ocular surface was, uh, and uh, Madam uh, did uh, uh, gave a very good talk about the clinical specular correlation. So you have to go step by step and look at everything. And uh, if it is a stressed ocular surface, I think that was a very good point uh, made by Dr. Arup. If it's stressed ocular surface, wait for two to three weeks, uh, treat it, and then uh, do a biometry and uh, uh, go ahead with cataract extraction. So thank you very uh, much. On messages, do a comprehensive step-by-step -step examination. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you very much. I think on behalf of all the speakers, I thank the AOS, uh, especially Dr. Santosh in particular, for the opportunity. Thank you very much for all of you for a patient hearing.